So hello everyone and welcome to our Adaptation Helpline webinar. We're very excited that so many of you could join us today. Um, we had to reschedule this webinar from late October, some of you may remember, because, um, because of a superstorm, because of Superstorm Sandy. So we're very happy to have you all here today. We've got, some, we've got four fantastic panelists lined up and I'm actually going to let our main presenter introduce each of the others. But for now, let me go ahead and welcome Lara Hansen. Uh, Lara is, uh, works with EcoAdapt and is really one of our fellows who is at the front lines of climate, climate adaptation. She's the chief scientist, I should say, and executive director of EcoAdapt, and that's an organization that she created to help develop the field of climate change adaptation, back before many people were even talking about it. Um, and the, the goal of the organization is to create a network that helps develop the science of adaptation to build capacity and to expand the field and to provide technical assistance and support to agencies and organizations that want to start implementing adaptation processes and procedures. Her work focuses on identifying the impacts of climate change and developing strategies to increase the ecosystem and natural resource resilience to better weather the effects of climate change, effects that we're already seeing. She works on projects around the world. She received her PhD from the University of California, Davis, and um, as a postdoc researcher, she was part of a US EPA University of California joint project that looked at the impacts of climate change on coral reefs in the Florida Keys. So she's a fantastic person to lead our webinar today. And the webinar was actually her idea. So with that, let me go ahead and hand things over to Lara. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you all of you folks who've come and joined us today for our second attempt at providing help. Um, so the Adaptation Helpline today is really about how you can access other members of the Switzer Network to help provide information to you as you start trying to integrate climate change into the work you do across the broad spectrum of things that Switzer Fellows and those of you who are on the call who are not Switzer Fellows do. Um, so the, the goal here is for you to ask us some questions and us to give you some answers, but before we can effectively do that or you can effectively identify what kind of questions you want to ask. It's usually, it's generally helpful to get some examples. So I am truly lucky to have convinced three fellow fellows um, to be part of this panel today um, or your adaptation helpline. Um, and we'll each be presenting sort of a snippet of a kind of project or approach that um, is used in adaptation so that you can get a, a sampler as it were of, of the adaptation universe. So the first speaker today is going to be Amber Paris, who is with the state of California's Department of Fish and Game, being renamed the Department of Fish and Wildlife, Cal Fish and Wildlife, um, and the creator of an innov innovative training program to build capacity um, in that agency and beyond. And she'll be sharing information about that with you. Uh, Patrick McCarthy from the Nature Conservancy, who's been doing some great work on implementing new adaptation frameworks and tools um, on the ground in both Nature Conservancy holdings as well as uh, the, the adjoining properties, both private and public beyond. Um, and then Healy Hamilton, who we're actually lucky we had the superstorm um, because we wouldn't have gotten Amber during the superstorm because she was marooned. And we also wouldn't have gotten Healy because she had a conflicting event. So we get the whole, and Healy uh, is now an independent adaptation thinker um, who will be sharing some of what she's been doing on some really cutting edge uh, downscaling and model use of how you can use climate information in very specific ways to answer climate questions. So without further ado, let us move on to Amber and she can share some of her thinking. She is the person in the orange shirt, in the green shirt rather, um, for those of you who are confused by her photo and she's gonna talk to you what she's been doing in California. Amber, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be um, on this panel with so many wonderful folks and to have so many of you on the phone. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about how the Department of Fish and Game within California, I guess as Laura said, soon to be the Department of Fish and Wildlife, is tackling sort of climate change adaptation. And the program, the climate science program started in 2008 when I was recruited to come out and start the program. And at the time, California had been very aggressive with um, addressing the emissions part with their Global Warming Solutions Act and with really focusing on emissions reductions. But no one had really tackled the adaptation 
um, piece of that yet in California. And so my big challenge with starting was one, how do I carve out a niche for the department whose focus would largely, largely be adaptation? And two, how did I make sure that fish and wildlife had a voice at the table in these conversations at the state level? And I quickly realized that the only way to accomplish this would be to pull my partners together to figure out how we were going to work on this collaboratively. And that's the first thing that I did was I pulled together a group of about 30 people representing our state and federal agencies, conservation NGOs, and just kind of got everyone around the table to roll up our sleeves and figure out how we were going to promote climate adaptation and what would soon evolve to be sort of climate smart conservation principles. And what we realized there at that, at, at that moment was that you know, we're never going to agree on everything. We all have different missions and responsibilities, but we do have common ground. And if we can focus on that, that's really how we're going to, um, you know, to find the greatest success together. And I'm really proud to say that that small, that small kind of group of 30 has turned into and grown over the years into more than 100 organizations representing state and federal agencies, um, conservation NGOs, the academic community, industry partners, tribal representation. So I'd like to say that the real kind of heart and soul of what we've accomplished as a state agency is really attributed to our partners. If you could go to the next slide, that would be great, Laura. So the core areas that we have that we have in building this program is focused on these kind of three um, kind of core areas, which is unity, integration, and action. And unity being creating and maintaining those vital partnerships, inclusion being integrating climate change into every single thing that we do as a department. And I think this is very different from having climate adaptation projects in that when people say, oh, what are your climate adaptation projects? It's not easy to say, oh, we have X, Y, and Z. And instead, I say we have a huge amount or a huge number of conservation projects that include climate change. And I think this is one of those things where it's not just about new research or new program. Integrating climate change into our responsibility as a department is really about a change in the culture of our agency. It's a change in the way that we approach problems. It's a change in the way we think about our conservation actions and our long-term management strategies. And then action is really you know, putting that thinking on the ground. And I think like many organizations, we're at that phase where we've done a lot of planning. Um, and we're really ready to move from that planning to action. And so that, um, about a year and a half ago, when I was thinking about how to really mainstream adaptation, how do we really start to get this work on the ground, I realized that we have done an incredible amount of planning. We have been doing vulnerability assessments. We've been pursuing all of these avenues of, of um, climate smart conservation. But we've missed this fundamental opportunity to provide a foundation of knowledge for our staff with the idea that if we could provide the tools and resources to empower our, our staff to, um, to become the climate leaders within the department. So this wasn't just a banner that I carry or that something that I carry, it's, um, you know, something that I'm doing on my own, but really it's from the ground up. And this is sort of the true kind of process of integration. So with that idea of um, building this foundation of knowledge, uh, decided to create with our partners working collaboratively the DFG Climate College. And if you could switch to the next slide. So our climate college, the goal of this was really to build a climate community within fish and game. But what made this unique is that we opened up this college to include everyone with the idea that we wanted to provide a foundation of knowledge for all of our staff. And that's not just our scientific staff. We have representatives from our law enforcement division, from our human resources, from our business management branch. We've got everyone there at the table that represents our department. And even um, you know, within our partners, we have a really nice composition of both the sort of folks you would, our normal partners you would expect to see, but also consultants and um, legislative branch and our local, um, local government, which is a really nice sort of new, new group to have at, at the table with us. So the idea was that the Climate College is going to provide that foundation of knowledge, promote networking with our partners, and to really provide this new approach to training. Um, if you could go one more slide, I'm almost finished. So the Climate College um, consists of these monthly lecture series that started in September that follow with some recommended readings that our lecturers put forward. There's an online forum for discussion and a final project at the end with several opportunities for certification. And all of these. Um, webinars are online. They're recorded via video. 
and available for you to get credit, both training credit through the department as well as through NCTC and the Wildlife Society. And what's been really phenomenal about this is just the response we have gotten from our staff. I remember when I pitched this to the director, I was thinking, oh my gosh, there's, I don't want to embarrass myself. Please let me have 10 people in the room with him when he gives the first opening lecture. And I'm so proud to say that we have close to 200 participants per lecture. Um, many of them via WebEx because we are hitting folks all over the state, but also around the country. And again, that composition is really, um, really just a nice sort of testament to how important um, this is to just a wide variety of folks. So we have about 70% of the participants are fishing game staff, and the other 30 again represent a nice um, mixture of state and federal conservation NGOs, local land trusts and um, different folks from different universities. So we really are having this whole sort of commitment to increasing climate literacy. So I'm really excited with how this is folded out. And again, we started in September. We just had our fourth lecture last week, and we'll continue through June. And I don't see that this, is, this particular sort of series of the Climate 101 will be repeated. We intend to continue building on these lecture series with more focused opportunities for um, you know, focusing down on climate change and specific issues. So I hope that gives you a really quick snippet, but we are really committed to um, building capacity internally as well as with our partners and to empowering the future leaders on climate change. Did I make my five minutes? <laughs> you did. <laughs> Thank you, Amber. So the next speaker is Patrick McCarthy of the Nature Conservancy. Patrick, you're up. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right, great. Um, again, I'm Patrick McCarthy. I um, work with the Nature Conservancy out of Albuquerque and Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I'm really happy to be able to, to take part in this, uh, in this panel. And I have to say, uh, first, that I uh, was really uh, glad and um, uh, interested to hear about Amber's work because, in fact, there's, it resonates with, I, I think, uh, our approach and what, what we've developed over the past few years um, in a very kind of similar approach to building capacity. So let me just start out, though, um, in giving my um, sort of overview and saying that here in the U.S. Southwest, the Four Corners area of, of the country, we consider ourselves to be um, in a region that is uh, a bellwether of sorts for, for climate change. We are seeing climate change effects that are perhaps uh, as dramatic and severe or perhaps even more so than in most other parts of the country. And we, be we began to see these effects years ago um, uh, with respect to the emergence of these um, uncharacteristically severe and large wildfires now turning into something that we call megafires here in the southwest, widespread um, forest dieback because of drought, uh, bark beetles, and interactive effects, and drying of our streams and rivers um, in exceptionally dry years. We're in the middle of a, a long-term drought right now. So it was actually back in 2007 that we first uh, gathered a large group, I think it was over 100 people of natural resource management practitioners in New Mexico to uh, address this problem, this emerging problem of climate change. And the direction we got from these folks at the time was that it would be really good to begin investing, uh, building capacity for understanding climate change and for coming up with local solutions uh, at particular places and then using these as kind of pilot projects to uh, build our understanding, build our awareness, build a community of practice that we could then um, uh, expand from uh, to other important uh, landscapes around the Southwest. So we created something called the, the Southwest Climate Change Initiative. Next slide, please. And uh, our idea was to um, bring scientists climate scientists, hydrologists, uh, biologists, and land and water managers together in uh, initially four different landscapes 
and the Southwest that we felt were particularly valuable and particularly vulnerable, and where both uh, biodiversity and livelihoods uh, were, were, were already being affected or would be affected. And we, we have brought people together in a, in a series of workshops in these places to do what we're calling social ecological adaptation planning. And uh, through this framework, what we're doing is creating working groups that are committed over the long term to not only understanding what the local effects of climate change are and may be in the future, but uh, making plans and, and, and uh, for, for building resilience of these landscapes and for the, the communities in these landscapes as these changes begin to begin to unfold. So um, we have a long-term presence. Uh, in each of these places, our staff has been there um, in some cases for decades. Uh, we may or may not, not actually own any uh, nature preserves on these lands, but we are committed to working, uh, to convening partners, and to, uh, to seeing through these adaptation strategies that we've developed in these particular landscapes. And as, as Amber suggested, um, it's not a question of coming up with adaptation plans, really what we're trying to do is, is redesign our conservation projects for climate change, uh, weave uh, this changing, uh, the, the, the changes that we see happening into uh, everything that we do in land and water management in these particular landscapes. So uh, the tools that we're using, a particular approach is called the Adaptation for Conservation Targets Framework. We've modified that for local use. We are working with uh, our primary partners include the, the Wildlife Conservation Society, the U.S. Forest Service, and the, 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 the NOAA Research, the uh, Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessment Programs, namely the Western Water Assessment in Colorado and Wyoming, and the uh, Climate Assessment for the Southwest, or CLEMAS, working in Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, they have been instrumental in in, in bringing the scientists together with the managers in this community of practice. So we've, we've undergone these, these workshops at, uh, at, at four places and we're, we're about to expand into new landscapes in 2013 uh, through a partnership with the, with the Forest Service and Department of Interior Agency. Uh, next slide, please. And we're very excited about going forward with this approach because the um, the communities that we're, we're, we are working with have, in fact, formed uh, groups that have gelled around these um, the, this approach and are carrying it forward, and they want to start sharing it with, with other sites. There should be one last slide here that I want to show. Sorry for all the animation here. Yeah, I just wanted to share with you a couple of publications that we have come up with recently in conservation biology. and advances in climate change research where you can learn more. Um, also, you can just look at under the climate change initiative uh, on Google and I can send links later if, if anyone is interested in, in digging into the details. So uh, with that, I'll close. Thank you, Patrick. Oop. So um, I'm going to take us into the ocean. My group works terrestrially as well as aquatically, um, but in order to balance out this um, series of talks, I wanted to give people a feel for the marine side of the equation. Um, obviously, the marine world has uh, its own array of climate uh, vulnerabilities, like the slide Patrick showed you of the desert southwest. Um, oceans are acidifying, warming um, on the positive side for oceans in some cases. Sea level is rising, so they're getting to be bigger, um, but unfortunately, they're taking over some fairly polluted close coastal lands, which causes its own suite of problems. Um, over it, the parts of the marine world have really been forerunners in thinking about adaptation, and that includes mostly tropical coral reef management. Um, tropical coral reef managers uh, had an, an early preview of what climate change was going to look like in the form of coral bleaching, which started pretty dramatically in the 1990s with global coral bleaching events. Um, and that group of folks who I was lucky enough to be part of um, during that period really started coming up with early ideas about how do we change resource management in order to include 
the reality of this new set of conditions. Uh, but the rest of the marine world has been a little bit slower to, to catch on and is pretty much in line with where the terrestrial world is. So in the past couple of years, um, I've started working with a number of temperate marine regions and some polar marine regions to think about how do you re-envision resource management in those areas. And one of the big tools that's used in the world of resource management, be it wherever in the latitudes, um, are marine protected areas um, and marine spatial planning. And so over the past few years, um, we've been working on how, to you, how do you improve that. And one of the projects that we've worked on was in the state of California with the MPA Monitoring Enterprise. Um, and the, the work that we did there was how do we help the state of California and the people who are involved in monitoring uh, rethink how they do monitoring so that it is um, sensitive to climate change and aware of climate change. Because one could very easily be doing monitoring to test the efficacy of a marine protected area or a terrestrial protected area for that matter, um, or a freshwater aquatic marine pr protected area, not a marine protected area, um, and uh, be missing what the signals were telling you because you weren't thinking about the fact that climate change was either affecting the markers you had, the, mark the parameters or the metrics you were using were insensitive, overly sensitive, um, or changed what the end result should be because of climate change. So we went through a process um, that we're actually doing in a number of temperate regions around North America to start with, um, where you sort of step back and you identify the objectives of protection and monitoring. Why have why was protection created for a given location? Um, and what was the goal of monitoring? Was the goal of monitoring just to maintain a, a pulse of the condition? Uh, or was it to um, alter management techniques in order to improve outcomes? Uh, and based on what those objectives are, you then can go through and identify the vulnerabilities to those objectives from those kind of threats that Patrick talked about for terrestrial systems and I earlier talked about for marine systems. And then you can identify the metrics that are climate sensitive or, um, or are not climate sensitive. It's also good to know what is not. So in the case of the working with the MPA monitoring enterprise, um, we wanted to know what were going to be the effects of climate change on temperate marine systems and how with the markers that people already were using, because in California there are very robust monitoring um, got frameworks that have been created for the different regions of the California coast, what of those markers are quite sensitive to climate change um, and might you be able to actually assess the effects of climate change? Which of them are sensitive to climate change and the way people are thinking about them in fact could confuse you as to whether or not you are seeing a traditional kind of change or a change that's predicated on climate change? Uh, and we worked up an array of metrics that uh, are modifications of, that just are simply existing metrics that are modifications of existing metrics to further augment our understanding of what climate change is doing to those systems. And then finally, what are some new novel metrics? And that can include things as simple as a species that moves into the northern end of the range or moves from a more southern range into a more northern range um, that you would not have seen before. And there are some really easy to spot species in California for doing that with things like the Garibaldi, which is a bright orange fish that if you were suddenly seeing north of the San Francisco Bay or up in the Humboldt Bay, you would identify as something being different. Um, so that tool is available online for people. Um, if you need guidance to it, simply ask. We've also been creating some more general guidance on climate smart coastal and marine spatial planning um, and identifying case studies of where are the places, whoa, where are the places that um, people are already starting to implement climate change into coastal um, and marine spatial planning. Well, okay, we'll try this one more time. There we go. So you can find information on all of that on the Climate Adaptation Knowledge Exchange or CAKE as we call it, which is www.cakex.org. If you haven't visited the site, I encourage you to. We refer to it as your online adaptation destination. Um, and pretty much everything that you're going to hear about today on this call, there is some coverage of on this resource. Um, and you, you should be able to find um, 
the papers that Patrick talked about. There is a link to the uh, climate training that Amber talked about, um, and some of the products that Healy is going to talk about will be there as well. So if you haven't checked out this resource, give it a look. It's free, um, and uh, hopefully you'll find it useful. So next, I will turn you over to Healy. Healy, take it away. Thank you very much. You can go ahead and advance to the next slide. I have a few slides that I want to cover. So, oh, okay, missing the first one. The first slide was a series of questions that uh, the Bureau of Land Management is asking itself about trying to assess the very large landscapes that, that BLM owns and operates uh, on behalf of the public good. So this is sort of an example of an organization that is really beginning at the beginning. Um, this is a you know, multi-use, largely extractive industry, or largely extractive and friendly to grazing, mining, um, and especially oil and gas and renewable energy, which are plaguing um, the BLM with all kinds of, of permits uh, that, that organizations are asking. And the Bureau of Land Management recognizes that climate change is a really um, is a force that is sweeping across its landscapes that it is has not a huge capacity to confront. So the Bureau of Land Management has undertaken a series of rapid eco-regional assessments and the organization NatureServe was uh, contracted in order to do four of these assessments so far and we're looking at two of the areas, the Central Basin and Range in red and the Mojave Basin and Range in orange. And I, my, my lab worked with NatureServe to do the climate change impacts assessment part of these rapid eco-regional assessments. So it's really an effort to sort of begin at the beginning in guiding what may end up being adaptation planning for the Bureau of Land Management. Next slide. So we focused on recognizing that there's a lot of spatial climate data products that can help us understand not only how climate change has already unfolded across this landscape, I mean, we, we have m many decades of weather station data that based on this data set called PRISM out of Oregon State University that we can use to understand how climate change already has changed. This, this data set interpolates weather stations providing gridded spatial climate data for monthly maximum temperature and precipitation and that's both that's max temperature min temperature and precip and it's available freely at four kilometer grid resolution and for a price at 800 meter spatial resolution so relatively fine product fine scale products that you can use to do time series analysis of how the climate has already changed and Patrick especially, but all of us, all of the presenters have discussed that we are already seeing the impacts of climate change in the landscape. And with time, time series gridded data of observations about climate, we can start to analyze those changes to try to, to tease them apart. What month, what variable, in what geographic location are we already seeing climate change impacts? And the next slide is basically taking a series of spatial climate data projects products into the future. So um, there are many different downscaled um, climate model products that are available. For this BLM project, we downscaled about 16 global climate models from the last assessment report of the IPCC to that four kilometer PRISM data set. So using sort of the best baseline that we know of in the United States in order to understand um, what the impacts are locally given a large suite of future climate models so that we can try to bracket uncertainty around by looking at um, many different possible outcomes. Although the, this BLM Rapid Eco Regional Assessment required the use only of the A2 sort of business as usual emission scenario. So next slide please. Using those spatial climate products for the current and the future, we were able to do some analyses that help the BLM understand what is unfolding on their landscape. So I'm not going to dive into methods here because we don't have too much time, but this is the Mojave Basin and Range, and what we're looking at is a comparison of um, 2060 climate compared to uh, an 80-year baseline, and the darker red are areas where 
out of 36 variables, monthly maximum temperature, monthly minimum temperature, and monthly total precipitation, how many of those variables are showing a departure above and beyond historical climatic variability for a 20th century baseline? So in this case, in the upper right-hand part of the, um, of the Mojave Basin, there are 12 out of 36 variables in a given pixel that are showing extreme climate change. And then just as important are sort of the gray, white, yellow areas. Those are areas where there are very little impacts of climate change projected from a suite of climate models in the mid-century compared to historical climatic variability. So there's a, a measure of that incorporated into this analysis. Next slide. In the next slide, we then break this down so that managers can see on the left column, these are which of those 36 variables are showing some kind of significant impact, and what is the area of the Mojave Basin and Range that is being impacted by them. So you can see that really it's the summer, both minimum and maximum temperatures that are projected to really exceed any kind of historical climatic variability or any norm that we might say in the 20th century. And that it's those summer temperatures which are linked to the monsoon. We can see there's only one small impact of precipitation. That's a, an August monsoon precipitation. A little bit of change over a small area. So this helps managers understand, you know, it's not just a global average temperature increase. It's, it has a seasonal signal to it. It's got a spatial signal to it, and it has a temporal signal. So this helps to tease apart what is it that they're actually facing. And then in my final slide, this is a series of bioclimatic models that have been sort of stacked on top of one another for the um, central basin and range. So we've taken a whole suite of landscape species and, and created suitable habitat models, suitable bioclimate models for the future relative to the present. And when you stack those up on top of one another, you start to help define what a climate refuge might look like for a suite of species that managers have already defined. So the, um, the red areas are the more species maintaining suitable bioclimate in the location where they are found today. So these are just a few sort of spatial climate products and sort of model outputs that have been put together um, with Stephanie Auer working on my team and then with Pat Comer and his team at NatureServe trying to serve the Bureau of Land Management in their, really, their first step efforts at understanding the impacts of climate change to the species and the landscapes that are so vast that they, man that they manage. Um, and it's really encouraging to see the BLM trying to take sort of the first steps in understanding and which then will lead to the ability to, to try to manage in a, in a more adaptive framework. So that was a, little, a, little, a lot of material to try to cover in just a few minutes, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about that. I guess so, it's uh, time to open it to questions for everybody. Thank you, Healy. Thank you, everyone on the panel, for giving very concise but enticing descriptions of what you're all up to. Um, and Lauren, I turn it over to you. Um, and Laura, I would like to, uh, I'll say a few technical words, but would you go ahead and take this opportunity to talk about your conference in Denver because everyone's on the call and when we get into Q&A, sometimes it can go, it can run over and people have to leave. So why don't you go ahead and talk about the forum and then we can talk about it again yeah. at the end. You bet. So um, all of the people that you've just heard from, I believe, um, are planning to be at the National Adaptation Forum in Denver, Colorado in April. Um, which is a great opportunity for those of you who are starting to think about how to incorporate climate change into what you do or are very deeply engaged in how you incorporate climate change into what you do. It's a three-day event for the exchange of information. Um, Amber is the chair of the program committee, which is a very big task because as of uh, this week when uh, the the submissions closed. Amber, we have 283 submissions of sessions, talks, and posters. Is that correct? No, 348. Oh my goodness, it's even bigger than I thought. Okay, so there's a lot of people who are doing stuff and there's a lot to be shared and learned. Uh, the event will have uh, sort of standard symposia-like presentations. It will also have working groups on specific topics um, and it will have training opportunities. Uh, by a host of um, groups 
um, from mostly around the country, although there's been some international interest as well. So uh, we hope that uh, many of you can make it. Super. So um, with that, thank you. I'd like to go ahead and open it up to questions. Um, you can ask questions uh, in a variety of ways. If you'd like to type in a question, you can put it into the questions panel or directly into the chat window. Or if you'd like to raise your hand and ask the question using your uh, computer headset or phone, we can call on you in the order in which your hands are raised. Well, uh, while we are waiting for people to go ahead and post their questions in, I did actually want to go to a question. We, we teased a few questions in our advertising and our marketing for this webinar. And I actually would like to, to take one of those questions and get uh, a few of you to talk about it. One of the questions we had posted was, what's the role of ecological restoration in a rapidly changing world? Um, so while we're waiting for folks to post their questions, maybe maybe you could tackle that. Patrick, do you want to start? Sure, I will. I'll have a go at that. It's a very good question and one that we've really struggled with. Um, I've gotten um, uh, some good insight from uh, uh, a professor named Don Falk at the University of Arizona, who he actually has an excellent talk on this that I think is available online. But Don's take on this is that, especially for forested systems and, and rivers and streams, if we um, can develop some uh, restoration, um, well, if we can begin to uh, uh, conduct ecological restoration on these systems that, that uh, rather than bringing them into the structure and composition of function that, of these systems into some, some uh, historical target range, historical range of variability, rather we look at maintaining or restoring the function of these uh, systems, whether it's a uh, function having to do with fire regime, uh, other ecological processes like natural flow regimes, then it will make these systems more resilient uh, over the long term to uh, the shocks that they are already seeing and, and we'll see more of in the future uh, because of climate change. So this is a, a concept that really resonates with us here in the Southwest, that is moving away from the historical range of variability targeted sort of concept of ecological restoration and moving toward uh, a focus on drivers, ecological processes and functions that will that are instrumental in, in maintaining the, uh, the health of these systems in a way that will help them uh, continue to provide services to people and also continue to support uh, biological diversity. So that's that's just a uh, a, a general overview of where, where the Nature Conservancy and our projects are going. And this is Amber. I think of the state of California, we'd really agree with Patrick in that you know, we have, even though we're thinking long term and thinking about what climate change means um, you know, in the next 10 years, the next 20 years, the 50 years, we still have responsibilities today to maintain and enhance ecosystem function to protect those species and habitats that are um, that are currently, you know, in these locations. I think that, you know, what Patrick was saying, the importance of building resilience in the systems is very important. But I think with restoration, we also have an opportunity to try to start planning for transformation and that we can plan our restoration efforts in a way that are going to help us move into, um, you know, some changes that we'll see in the future because of climate change. And, and one last thing I'll just throw out there is I think in particular for coastal wetlands, restoration for coastal wetlands is we have some opportunities to enhance um, our carbon sequestration potential. So I think that's another I'll just add on, tack on with, um, with uh, Patrick's comments as well. I just want to add very quickly that I think there's an important role for ecological forecasting as we design our systems of ecological restoration because as both, of, as both Amber and Patrick mentioned, we need to be designing towards the future rather than designing towards a historical baseline. And so it really is a chance to design our landscapes, but with future conditions in mind, or at least the conditions we are observing a transition toward. So how do we increase soil moisture retention capacity? How do we you know, connect our landscapes by restoring riparian corridors? with vegetation that is going to be able to be a little bit more tolerant of the kinds of fluctuation and precipitation we may see. So having the best possible understanding of the conditions we're moving towards will allow us to design our ecological restoration projects um, with future conditions in mind. 
So thank you, everyone. We have a question from Eleanor. I'm going to go ahead and post it to the chat window. But the question is, if you could recommend a single book to help non-climate scientists understand climate change, what would it be? Well, here's a perfect chance to plug climate savvy. That's, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Laura, I just have to do this because this book is so fantastic. Um, so Laura has written a book. Laura and her colleague Jennifer has written a book called Climate Savvy. It has a, it's, first of all, it's got a great sense of humor, and it has fantastic case studies, and there's a really good, very understandable section about basic climate change, but laced all throughout it is what to do about it and it's really wonderful references. So as far as a digestible and full of information and full of references and even will make you laugh, um, I think I've bought like 20 copies of Climate Savvy. Everyone I know has it. Wow. Thank you. It's, for no, that. Laura, it's odd. Well, I had, I mean, I wasn't going to let you do that. I had to do that for you. <laughs> but it's a great question. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add. Well, let me let me put in um, my own uh, plug for Laura's book. It's very good. Um, uh, the one I wanted to suggest is uh, it's regionally appropriate. I don't know if, it's, if other folks are going to be interested, but I think it's a very good survey of climate science and also covers the impacts on on people and communities. And that is a book called A Great Aridness by uh, William Du Bois. It came out last year, I think, and. You know, I can um, I can see if I can post a link too. Yeah, and then there are an array of more popular press books. One that everyone cites and loves to talk about, including me, is The Weather Makers by Tim Flannery, um, which is a very uh, it, it's a popular press book rather than a a, a more um, technical book. Although I, I try to think of climate savvy as not too technical. Oops, sorry, I had my mic <laughs> muted. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, so coming back just for a second to some of the questions that we had posted, we're still open for questions, everyone. Everyone's, I think, thinking through and looking up the links I'm posting. <laughs> and I'll have the one for the weather makers up in just a minute. Um, but one of the other questions that we had sort of teased people with that I think would be good to look at is, um, and this one I think is, is more for Healy, but anyone can jump in, is if you have to choose between parcels of land to preserve, how do you set criteria? that will take climate change into consideration. So I think you talked about the criteria that you had chosen, but how do you set those criteria depending on where you are and, and what you're looking at? Well, of course, the information that we have about the future mostly comes from global climate models. I, uh, and so those are sort of our best tools for trying to understand what impacts might be on any given landscape. I tried in my own few minutes to make a plug for understanding, for using observations of, of weather that has already occurred and so that we can look at time series to understand what those impacts are. When you, when you are able to do a time series of spatial climate analysis from the current towards the future, you begin to identify that interaction between topography and climate that leads to um, local climatic refuges that, you know, places where we may see less impact because there's higher topographic heterogeneity or there's more of a north-facing slope. There's places where plants and animals can move to, to find sort of microclimatic relief. Um, and you also identify areas of um, really significant transition already away from any kind of 20th century baseline changes. So the eastern front of the northern Rocky Mountains, for example, is already seeing extraordinary climate impacts. We don't even need climate models um, to show us that. It's happening already. And so really trying to understand these areas of high impact where we need to be managing for transition and areas that may be a little more naturally um, resilient because of effects of interacting effects of topography and climate, I think that those are important, at least from a climatic perspective, really important criteria to take into consideration. And then, of course, there's that, just that local social value, that sense of place, biodiversity value. So that's, those are, um, there's a whole suite of other values. But since we're talking about trying to prioritize in the face of climate change, I would argue for those time series spatial climate analysis as a, as a fundamental piece of information to inform that decision. 
Super. And uh, Healy, this I is like actually. I add one thing. Go ahead, Laura. Can I add one quick thing to Healy's um, point, and that is to consider not just the climate layers, but the non-climate layers and how those interact with climate change. So there are an array of stresses and um, physical uh, features that are happening across the landscape. Some of those things you can use to identify refugia, but you can also look at what are the interactive um, effects that are going on and how might you protect differently and prioritize differently given those interactive things. And that can have to do with things like forestry practice or mining practice or urban development, um, roads, all sorts of things that wouldn't be in the strict climate analysis but interact um, equally importantly. So Thank we have, you, Lara. Yeah, we have two questions here and they're both related to what you're both talking about. So I'm gonna go ahead and pose them maybe at the same time and, and let you both answer them. The first question was from Jeff Collins, and he was asking if Healy could speak a bit more about the method for the last slide that you presented on identifying uh, maintained bioclimate areas, which I think is a, a really excellent question. And then Robert asked something related to what you just said, Lara, which is how, uh, how have you addressed uncertainties of species responses to climate change and adaptation planning, which would certainly be one of those sort of non-traditional criteria that you need to look at um, like the ones you just mentioned. So maybe we could tackle Jeff's questions, question first about that last slide you presented in identifying uh, maintained bioclimate areas. And then I'll reread Robert's to just remind you and I'll put it in the chat so you've got it there. Sure, so really briefly, um, working with the Bureau of Land Management and with NatureServe, the primary contractor on the Rapid Eco Regional Assessments, um, we identified a series of what we called landscape species, basically species that are of particular management concern for which we had very good species distribution data from all of the fantastic efforts that NatureServe has made over the years to acquire and document species distribution data. Um, we used only climate variables here in creating a suitable bioclimate model for the current. Um, we used a we looked at a few different methods, but um, because we had presence-only da data, we used Maxent, um, very popular species distribution modeling algorithm. And then we looked at um, six different future climate models uh, from the IPCC fourth assessment report and asked where in the future does the bioclimate exist where it also exists today for about 13 different species. And that map is essentially a stacking of all of the pixels where a suitable bioclimate exists today and into the climate altered future from at least two of the six climate models. So that's a brief and um, a brief explanation of the methods, which I'm happy to talk to anyone more about um, offline since we're running out of time and want to give everybody a chance. Amber, do you want to talk at all, or Patrick, about how you're including uncertainty in species response? Um, this is Amber. Uh, I could just add that we're in the process of um, updating our wildlife action plan in which climate change is a major, um, has a major role for integrating climate change throughout that. And one way that we're looking at that is to step away from the single species focus your sort of habitat for and with Dog really likes what sorry, I have to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> Talk about the animals, um, but trying to have kind of a our target based on um, habitat and ecosystems in which a variety of our our you know, the greatest conservation needs fall. Also have a, a separate kind of um, analysis going on of vulner a series of vulnerability assessments for different taxa. So we're trying to come at it from a variety of different angles. If we recognize that there is kind of no one size fits all analysis for taking into account these species, but we also want to capture those that um, might be vulnerable to climate change that are not already on a list because of you know, either habitat fragmentation or some other pressure that's stressing that species. So kind of the, coming at it from a bunch of different angles trying to, to come up with the best sort of planning, um, I'm sorry, management strategies um, through the Wildlife Action Plan revision. Yeah, and let me just do a quick follow-up, if I may. This is Patrick, and we're like Amber. Um, we're approaching this in, um, uh, from a, a bunch of different angles. I'll mention two. One is 
uh, as Amber mentioned, we're, we are we too are moving away from that species-focused approach, moving toward system resilience, as I tried to describe earlier. And the second way we are trying to address it is by uh, where we do have um, a focus, where the folks we're working with have a focus on a particular species because it's, say, federally listed, like the Mexican spotted owl, we are trying to deal with uncertainty by coming up with a number of different um, scenarios, climate scenarios, for starters, and also different scenarios with respect to species response, and doing our best to identify ways to build resilience and uh, maintain or sustain habitat for that particular species with a, that are robust, um, that is effective in a, in a, in a range of, of climate scenarios and a range of response scenarios. And one of the important things that I would just add to um, how you address uncertainty in response to climate change is the importance in recognizing that if you don't start thinking about climate change and how you manage a species or a resource or an ecosystem, um, that there's a great deal of uncertainty in whether or not what you're doing will continue to be effective. Um, and that's a, a, a piece of uncertainty that we tend to um, downplay the reality of and believe that we need to get the climate projection perfectly right before we start modifying how we do things, when in fact, we're probably at greater risk of doing nothing and continuing to use the methods that we've always used under standard conditions. And a lot of it becomes these examples of um, what Patrick and Amber talk about in the way that management is changing in that we have to have management that has um, a real-time monitoring component to it that's actually assessing whether or not um, what we thought was going to happen is happening and how the system is responding to it. And as um, Healy mentioned, really knowing what are the, the, the community, and I use the word community here not just to mean people communities, but management communities, um, wh what is their goal? What is their comfort level? What is it that they're trying to achieve um, as their long-term outcome? And what do they, uh, how do they adapt what they're doing? not just how do they help the system adapt. So, Hey, Laura, um, do you mind advancing to that last slide of mine? Because it seems like there's a lot of interest, and I just wanted to introduce this relatively new resource that people may not know about um, of a spatial climate data set covering all of Western North America, so into Northern Mexico, um, that recently came out. And it has uh, many projections of the future as well as historical data, including some very important derived variables like climatic moisture deficit, so, so sort of moving beyond just monthly temperature and precipitation. And uh, I will, I'll put the URL into the chat window for this, but just wanted to let people know that it's out, out there. It's relatively new and not in the journal that many of us probably read that often. Great. Super. So we just have a couple more minutes left. I just wanted to remind everyone that's participating today in the call that we will have the recording of this webinar available on our website. That's switzernetwork.org forward slash blog. It will be on our blog um, probably this afternoon, possibly not until tomorrow morning, but it will be up very soon. And so we invite you to, to forward that link along to colleagues who, who weren't able to attend today. You'll also receive a follow-up email from the GoToWebinar system in about an hour after this webinar ends with that link. So that will be available in your email. Um, I would like to offer the panelists just a moment to uh, give us one last thought, each of you to, to sort of give us one last thought on this topic and, and how you're planning to move forward with this topic professionally. Amber, let's start with you. This is the time I wanted to go last, Laura. Um, <laughs> um, I just want to say that there's just a lot of really amazing work going out there, and that I think partnerships are really the key to so much of the advancement of the planning and action around climate change. And we really can't underestimate the power of those partnerships. And within the conservation community, we have talked about this forever, but now with climate change, it's really the time to really walk our talk around partnerships. And I think that together we can do a lot of you know, really great work and more so than that we can do alone. So um, I think, you know, as far as the state of California, we'll continue to focus on partnerships and really advancing adaptation along with mitigation hand in hand. Patrick? Yeah, um, I, I guess my closing thought is that 
um, we have an opportunity to unleash the power of communities now that folks are beginning to see the effects of climate change not only on um, plants and animals and ecosystems but on economies on their the fabric of their communities uh, we have an opportunity to expand the community of practice around uh, building resilience and form groups informal or otherwise uh, to rally around uh, the kind of planning and more important implementation that we need to do to prepare ourselves for um, really rapid change that's that's already occurring certainly here in the southwest and I think uh, across the continent as well feeling I am very hopeful about the idea of large landscape conservation through the, the landscape conservation cooperatives and the, the possibility, as Amber said, bringing partnerships together. The, land, the LCCs are sort of embody that idea of trying to operate at large landscapes through um, partnerships. I know that they face their challenges, um, that implementation is a bit of a challenge, but I am very encouraged to see so much effort at um, sort of look, taking the satellite view of how we will design resilient landscapes and um, and seeing that that scale of, of conservation is the direction that we're moving toward. And certainly Patrick has some great examples of that with his area in the desert southwest. I know that Amber is a leader in the LCC for California. Um, and that all across the country, I really think the LCCs are, offer the scale at which we should be addressing this kind of a, of a problem. Excellent. That is, those are all wonderful things that I'm thrilled that uh, we're at the tips of your tongues. Um, I wanted to just encourage people in order to do all three of those things uh, to come to the National Adaptation Forum. Um, additionally, this idea of an adaptation helpline or help desk um, is something that I'm actually trying to formally create, um, and there is a foundation currently considering a proposal to fund such a thing. So if anyone who's participating today thinks, man, if there was one of those that I could call like a reference library desk um, and get guided help, um, I would really like that. Let me know, um, because if it is funded, we will be queuing up to start that in January um, with a, a team of colleagues from a variety of organizations. So. If you think adaptation help is something you want to be on this phone call, please contact me. But obviously, contact any one of us who is on this call. We're all deeply involved in this field um, and interested in creating new partnerships, um, as Amber said, and building those um, links with colleagues who are novice and pro so that we can move this, as Patrick said, community of practice forward so that it really is a community of practice. This is a field that has come to the fore even faster than conservation biology did because by necessity. Um, but, it, but even more tr uh, challenging is the speed at which we need to get really good at it to match that speed of climate change that Patrick and Healy both mentioned. So thank you all for coming and participating with us today. Lauren, uh, I turn it back over to you. Super. Thank you so much. I can't, I can't thank you enough, Lara, and all of our participants. We're very excited that everyone could join us on this date since, as you mentioned before, even if it had taken place in, back in October, this webinar wouldn't have been, um, we wouldn't have had all four of you together. So we're really thrilled that that worked out. There are lots of links in the chat window. Just a reminder to everyone, you will receive an email shortly from the system with a link to our blog as well as our website where you can always get a recording of this webinar. You can also get more information about all of our panelists as well as their contact details through that listing of the recording. Everything will be cross-linked, so it'll be very easy for you to find that data. Um, thank you again so much, and uh, go well, and let's hope everyone avoids any more storms this winter. Let's hope the weather cooperates for the next six months. Thank you again, and thank everyone you, have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Lauren. Bye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.